Welcome back. Chapter 21, Tuesday, June 13, 2017. It was the following week and Sydney and Derek took a cab to the Lower East Side. A light mist fell just enough to crystallize the lights of New York and cause the driver to flash his wipers every few seconds. Brake lights and stoplights smeared across the road in red streaks. It was Tuesday, close to 10 p.m., and Derek was not happy to be running around so late. Why can't he meet us during the day? He just got off of work, said this was the only time he had. Take it or leave it. I took it because I need his testimony for Friday's episode. If you can frame it and Leslie can cut it before our deadline. Who is he? There are a hundred of cops we could ask. Don Marcus. He did some work for me, my first documentary. I trust him. Plus, he has no issue being filmed, signed everything. Derek looked at his watch. I'm coming in late tomorrow, just letting you know. No, you're not. We've got to get this to production by noon to make the deadline. Sydney leaned forward in the cab. Up there to the left, she said to the driver. The cabbie pulled to a stop outside the bar. Sydney dropped the money over the seat and stepped into the misty Manhattan night. They found Detective Marcus inside with a sweaty, with a sweaty highball of scotch resting on a wrinkled napkin in front of him. Hey, Sid, he said when she entered. Hey, Don, thanks for meeting me. This is Derek. He'll record for me. Drink? Sure, Casamigo on the rocks. Don pointed at Derek, who shook his head. He ordered Sydney's tequila and another scotch for himself. Probably better to do this in a back booth, Sydney said. They took their drinks to the back of the bar. Derek turned on the light of the camera and the, and the back corner of the bar came to light under the brightness. A few patrons, patrons turned to look but quickly lost interest. You've read through the case, Sydney said. What are your thoughts on the way the investigation was handled? Don smiled. It was handled like a bunch of rookies who don't know their asses from a hole in the ground. Sydney pouted her bottom lip. Thank you, but I probably can't use that on prime time. Try again. Don paused, took a sip of scotch. In my 25 years on the force and 13 years in homicide, I've never seen a case mishandled as badly as this one. Much better. Now why? Expand on what you read and how you would do it differently. Let's start with the interviews. Not only were they conducted incorrectly, but possibly fraudulently. If you compare the list of people interviewed to the hotel's registered guests, you'll see right away many guests were never interviewed at all. So people who were present at the hotel the night Julie and Chris died were never asked basic questions about what they saw or what they heard, or about their whereabouts that night. Out of 180 guests, 88 guests, only 104 were interviewed. What happened to the other 84? Plus, the staff at the hotel were interviewed in groups. This is gross mismanagement. All potential witnesses and suspects should be interviewed separately. This is done for many reasons but the most common is to confirm individual accounts of the night in questions corroborate with each other. Interviewing witnesses and suspects individually also help create a timeline of events. Many members of the staff were interviewed in groups of two and three, which allows their stories to change based on what, what each interviewee is hearing through the course of questioning. Gross, gross incompetence. Have you read through the interview of a guest named Ellie Riser? No, I have not. To the best of my knowledge, this person was never interviewed by the St. Lucia's investigators. Ellie states in letters to me and in a recent interview that police did question her on the day Julian body was discovered. If so, Detective Marcus said, there's no record of it. Ellie claims she was in Grace Abol's room the night Julie and Chris was killed. She says her testimony was not allowed at Grace's trial because she was intoxicated during the day and her accounts of the evening could be relied upon to be accurate. Could not be relied upon to be accurate. 
I don't know if she was drunk or not, Marcus said, but if she provided a clear alibi, and if this had happened in the States, the judge would have allowed her to testify and allow the defense to cross-examine. Then a jury would decide if she was reli a reliable witness. However, with her interview never being formally logged by the investigators, it disappeared from existence. This shows me that the detectives were looking for information that matched their suspicions, not allowing the information they found to lead them to their suspicions. A very backward way of running an investigation. From what I read, they decided early on that Grace Abold was guilty and then set out to prove it, tried to make everything fit that narrative. Sydney referred to her notes. A shoe print was found near the bluff where Julian fell to his death. Forensics matched the print to a shoe found in Grace Abode's room. Soil analysis showed that the shoe held dirt that came from this location. How accurate is the forensic in your opinion? Very. It means Grace Abode or someone wearing that shoe was on the bluff at the same point at some point in time. What I find interesting is that there were six other prints found at the bluff, but investigators never bothered to look into them or find out who they belonged to. And it was documented that day before Julian Chris was killed, the entire wedding party had hiked together to the summit of Gross Baton. So there you go. The shoe prints could have been created during that hike and not when Grace Sabol supposedly went back to the bluff to commit a murder. What's worse is that the detectives sequestered, sequesteredly 12 pairs of shoes from a hotel guest, from hotel guests, photographed the thread and ran ID analysis on them to come up with the make and manufacturer. But once they got a hit, on Grace of Bold shoes, they stopped there. They didn't bother to see if any of the other prints on the bluff matched the shoes they collected. This is called selectively investigating. They didn't want it formally recorded that any other matches were discovered on the bluff because the defense would have used it at trial. Sydney referred to her notes again and took a sip of tequila. Julian's blood was found in Grace Abode's cottage at Sugar Beach, she said, as was bleach. The suggestion was that the bleach was used to clean away the blood. How accurate again is the method by which this evidence was collected? Very, he said again. Basic swab testing after luminal application, squirt, squirt the luminol, turn on the black light, bleach in blood, Invisible to the naked eye, glow blue. The DNA results of the blood discovered matched to Julian Chris is accurate. Detective Marcus looked over at Derek. Turn it off for a minute. Derek took the camera off his shoulder. Listen, Marcus said to Sydney. I think they targeted her. I think they convicted her early on in the investigation and too narrowly focused their energy on proving that she did it. They conducted too few interviews and did, and did them in an ass backward manner that would never fly in the States. And they disregarded evidence that didn't match their theory. The consensus when I asked around about this case was that a murder on a small island is bad for business especially if a local islander murdered a U.S. tourist. An American killing an American, he shrugged his shoulders, not so much of a problem and won't have an effect on tourism as long as the case is closed quickly. Even if there were clearly things that pointed to Grace's innocence, Marcus took another sip of scotch. You know what prosecutors say around here? Any DA can convict a guilty man, but it takes a special DA to convict an innocent one. That's terrible. I'm not suggesting 
that was the mindset down there. But either way, Sid, there are some things about this case that can't be ignored. His blood in her room is one of them. Her prints on the boat or that was used to kill him is another. That her best friend claims she was with Grace the night Julian Chris was killed is one piece to consider. But I'm sorry, Sid, the forensic trumps someone's drunken recollection. He drained his scotch. This friend, is she reliable? She's a doctor, Sidney said without conviction. Plenty of doctors are liars. Do you trust her? Sydney thought back to her interview with Ellie Riser. I've got no reason not to. What's the timing? When did Grace's friend come to her room? Was it late at night, after the murder could have happened, after Grace could have cleaned the room? Sydney took a deep breath and shook her head. I'm not sure. She stayed overnight, but I don't know what time she arrived. I'll have to pin that down the timeline. Her cell phone rang. Sorry, she looked at the caller ID and saw a Raleigh, North Carolina number. Hold on a minute. She held the phone to her ear. Sydney Ryan? Sydney? It's Livia Cuddy. Dr. Cuddy, is everything all right? Yeah, sorry to call so late. No problem, I'm still working. Me too. Actually, couldn't sleep after I started looking into the Sabol case. Did you get a chance to look at Julian's autopsy? I did, and I think we need to meet. Sydney hesitated. Find something? I did, and I'm sure you'll want to see it. A discrepancy? That's a police word for it, Dr. Cuddy said. Complete incompetence is another. In what way? The skull fracture. What about it? There's no way it was caused by a boat oar. Ooh, and that's the end of chapter 21. Okay. <laughs> so the cop that she's talking to is 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 saying that they they butchered the investigation. They didn't really do a real investigation and all along it's been I've been leaning towards that they didn't do a good one because they wanted it to uh, be over really quick. And now the finger is being pointed to Ellie, right? Is Ellie a suspect? Now, Ellie has not been on my radar until now. But there's no but. She could be a suspect. And now... They're saying the 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 um the doctor is saying that his skull fracture could not have been caused by the ore. What? What? So, uh, we gotta we gotta see and hear what the doctor gotta say. So I'm gonna see y'all in the next chapter. Bye.